أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد In the name of Allah, most beneficent, the most merciful, I welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, to the second session of today. Uh, Dr. Srar Ahmed covered two dimensions, two very important dimensions of our corporate collective life, the political and economic. And in this session, he will cover the social system of Islam, family life and social system, with special reference to the status of women. As you know, this uh, status of women is a burning issue in contemporary thought, and he will dilate upon it from his own Quranic perspective. I request Dr. Israr Ahmed to please present his ideas. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'du fa'awuzu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير الحجرات آية 13 and in Nisa سورة النساء the fourth سورة الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله صدق الله العظيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قالي Dear brothers and sisters from Adam and Eve May Allah bless both of them and may Allah bless us all. The topic of this session, as the brother has said, is a very burning issue, a very controversial issue. And I very well know that what I am going to say will not be easily palatable to most of you brothers and sisters. To the Western mind and the modern civilization, these things are very alien. But I want to start on the social system of Islam with the equality of all human beings that the Quran has stressed. 
no one is high no one is low by birth there can be high and low on the basis of acquired characters if you are more virtuous you are higher level if you are not so you belong to a level lower level if you have attained great knowledge you are at a higher level if you are ignorant you are at a lower level but these are the acquired characters by birth nobody is higher nobody is lower none is superior none is inferior i have quoted ayah number 13 of the 49th this chapter or surah of quran al hujurat it translates like this ya ayuhan nas o mankind inna khalaqnakum we have created you all min zakarin wa unsa from one male and one female you are all, all the progeny of adam and eve wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qabaila then we divided you into nations and tribes let ta'arafu only so that you may be recognized who is he from which part of the world is he this is only for recognition nothing high nothing low inna akramakum inda allah atqakum the more respectable amongst you are those who are the most god fearing who have the maximum regard for god in their hearts and allah is alim and khabir he knows everything he sees your hearts not what you say but what you have in your heart you know it so this equality of humanity it covers all human beings males and females any nation any color any creed humanity will remain there this is the basis of human brotherhood now this equality human equality is that thing which even ag wells has testified and said it was the biggest achievement of muhammad and why i said even he criticizes him severely but in his concise history of the world when he reaches the last part last chapter on muhammad he quotes from the last sermon the sermon of the last pilgrimage the departing pilgrimage there he said la fazla li arabiyyin ala ajamiyyin there is no superiority of any arab over any non arab wala li ajamiyyin ala arabiyyin nor the non arabs have any superiority over the arabs wala ahmara ala aswada also red and white people they are not superior to the blacks wala aswada ala ahmara and also vice versa the blacks have no superiority over the whites illa bi taqwa superiority or inferiority will be based on taqwa how much regard one has for allah how much he fears for the great and grand accountability of the day of judgment and keeps himself within the limits of the sharia not transgressing the sharia so at this point as you will wrote i am quoting i think maybe some word might be changed otherwise i remember it fully although the sermons of human equality fraternity and freedom 
were said before also. And we find a lot of such sermons in Jesus of Nazareth. But it must be admitted that it was Muhammad who for the first time in human history established a society based on these principles. And this is the biggest testimony coming not from any friend but from the foe. His enemy, he criticized him bitterly, badly with a very bad taste, just like Salman Rushdie and Taslima Nasreen of Bangladesh in this same way. But here he has to bow down. But please note, this passage has been deleted in the recent edition of H. G. Wells' Concise History of the World. The present editors couldn't swallow it. But you will have to refer to some older edition from libraries to find this. And I have cautioned you because maybe if you go and open the book and you don't find this passage, you may think that I have lied to you. So you have to go to the former edition. So now this is, I think, the biggest achievement of Islam. This applies to even women and men. By birth, men are not superior to women. Women are not inferior to men. They share human dignity, human respect, human honor absolutely equal. The moral field is open to both of them. They can go to the heights of morality. The spiritual field open to both equally. You can go. If there was Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani of Baghdad, a saint, very renowned saint, you must have heard about him. We had Rabia Basriya from Basra. Again, at the height of that spirituality. And let me point out here that the Prophet said, if a person has reared two daughters, educated them, and then got them married, his seat in paradise is reserved. He didn't say this for the sons, it's for the daughters. And you may recall that in that Arabian society, these daughters were so much disliked. In their infancy, they were buried alive. But Islam gave this honor. In the same way, you have to respect your parents. But the rights of mother are three times greater than the father. Again, three, but doctor is not here, but us. Three times. One of the companions asked the Prophet, وسلم, who among the people deserves my service most? He replied, your mother. He asked again, and after her, again, your mother. For the third time after her, your mother. When he asked for the fourth time, then he said your father. So this is the dignity that Islam has given to women. As about at the religious level, their equality. Let me quote one ayah from the third chapter. It is 195 ayah. In the previous ayah or verse, there is a prayer, very long prayer of the believers to Allah. They are praying. I don't mention that. But in this ayah, 
195 Allah says fastajab lahum rabbuhum their lord accepted and granted their prayer ani lau diyo amal amili minkum that i am not going to let any good deed of yours go in waste min zakarin aw unsa whether you are a male or a female baadukum min baaz you are from each other from the same father you have the son and the daughter the whom of the same mother has gave birth to the daughter and the, and the son there can be no difference no superiority no inferiority all together now if you keep in mind what was the status of women before islam in most of the countries nearly a whole of the world among hinduism among christianity they were thought to be evil in nature they don't have spirits in them only males have the spirits and so on and the condition of women in india among hindus was the worst but islam raised the status of women islam gave them a legal personality you are a legal person you can own property you can do business you cannot be married without consent full legal person your parents can arrange for your marriage but with your consent not without your consent so i come to the third point the most important feature of islamic society is the strength of the family system the institution of family as an institution it must be strong and this is in direct contrast to the modern civilization of the conditions generally in the west this institution has been more or less destroyed now what are the dimensions first of all respect for the parents respect for the parents serving the parents at five places in quran allah has mentioned the rights of parents just after his own rights wa qada rabbuka la ta'budu illa iya your lord has decided that you will not worship or obey anyone else than him wa bil walidain ihsana and he has ordained upon you service respect good treatment with your parents this is one example imma yablughanna indakal kebara ihdahuma aw kilahuma fala taqul lahuma uffin if any one of these parents or both reach old age with you never say even oh to you to them although obedience is not necessary if they command you something contrary to the sharia of allah no obedience obedience is for those who ask you to follow the sharia but service would be heavier keeping your shoulders down before them not like this no you should keep your shoulders bowed down before them waqfiz lahuma janah zull min rahma so this relationship on this basis in our society parents invest themselves fully in their offsprings 
they don't try to keep something for their old age because they have the surety that as we are looking after them now they will be looking after us when we are old this is the tradition not to put them in old houses so that they can't even meet the sons or the daughters longing to see the son or daughter you can keep them at your home because your privacy you may say it your independence is limited by their ex- presence over there no this family system first born parents and the offspring now among the offspring brotherhood between brothers and sisters quran says there is a relation of womb ram uterus your brothers you are bound by the uterus of your mother try to consolidate it strengthen this brotherhood between the brothers and the sisters number 3 marriage it is here that men and women are not equal when a woman and a man they enter into an agreement of marriage living together to start a family the husband is the head of the family there can be no institution without a head one head you can can't have two at the top if you have more than one there will be chaos you can have only one managing director of a firm not two but you can have directors maybe 10 20 but managing director has to be one so it is not based on gender the superiority or inferiority no it is the organization all human beings are equal but the officer and the pn are they equal a minister sitting in his office and there might be someone standing at the door at the gate are they equal are the generals and the general soldiers equal this is a question of administration organization here women have to accept the authority of men authority that is why i quoted the ayah 32 from the fourth surah ar rijal qawwamun ala nisa men are rulers over women why bima fadl allah ba'du ala ba's because allah has given some more than the other the physical strength that he has given more to men wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim and due to what they spend from their wealth when they enter into the agreement of marriage the dower money is paid by the husband would be husband although marriage is a requirement for women also just as it is a requirement for men but he has to pay and she accepts so here and then islam puts no responsibility of maintaining the family on women or mother all economic responsibilities financial responsibilities they are on the shoulders of men bima faddala allah ba'dhum ala ba'dhin wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim 
فصالحات و قان تاتن سو دا گڈ ویمن ورچوس ویمن دے آر اوبیڈینٹ ٹو دیئر ہسبینڈس فرسٹ اوبیڈینس ٹو گاڈ اینڈ ہز میسنجر دیٹس دا بیسس آف ریلیجن بٹ ہیئر ان دی انسٹیٹیوشن آف فیملی وائف ہیز ٹو اوبے دی ہسبینڈ If by any argument or by any appeal she can get something accepted by the husband, it's okay. But if the husband is insisting on something which is not forbidden by Allah, if it is forbidden by Allah, no obedience. There is no obedience for any creation, any man, any institution, anything. In the affairs where there is disobedience for Allah. لا تعالى المخلوق في معصية الخالق. But if it is مباح, it is halal, it is permissible, you have a difference of opinion. Wife has his, her own opinion, the husband has his own opinion. Now if the wife can, by appeal or by argument, if she can make the husband agreeable, to her point of view it's okay but otherwise she will have to obey and let me quote here i was very much impressed when i read in an interview of sara ferguson when she was going to be married to prince andrew she said I am not that timid type of woman. I am not going to say I will obey him. I came to know this is something necessary for a Christian marriage. I was delighted. The light is from the same source. In our marriage, a woman doesn't say this, these words. But the teaching of the Quran is the same. You have to obey it. And she must have said that I will obey him when she was being married in the blessed minister obey. Anyhow, for the strengthening of this family, I have told you one dimension, parent of split relationship. Second dimension, the brotherhood among brothers and sisters. Thirdly, a strong bond between the spouses. One dimension I have mentioned, that wife has to obey. The second dimension, strong bond of love is required. And Adultery, fornication, what to speak of rape, absolutely forbidden. The whole attraction of the sexes, which is natural. We know that Freud has said that this is the most potent motive, the sex. And it is definitely very potent, no doubt. Not the most potent, but it is potent. And there is the danger of anarchy, illicit relationships, illegitimate relationships, without any marriage bond. So Islam, you know, the objective is to eradicate zina, to eradicate fornication, to eradicate adultery. But this is such an issue that Quran has not said, don't commit zina, don't commit adultery. Quran said, don't go even near zina. Keep away from it. Keep at a distance. Now, what are those distances that Islam has suggested? Number one, 
the society has to be segregated. No intermixing of the sexes. Lest this attraction comes into play and there is some foul play. Islamic society is segregated, absolutely segregated. Different teaching institutions, schools, colleges, different universities, segregated hospitals, hospital for women, women are the patient, women are the doctors, women are the nurses, men's hospital. Men as patients, men as doctors, men should be the nurses over here, not female. And what happens in the hospitals is of common knowledge. We know that in the military, no medical units go to the front line with female nurses. All the nurses who go to the front line, they are male. So hospitals should be there, but they should segregate it. Segregation of sexes is the fundamental principle of Muslim society. Number two, covering of the body, especially the sex organs and the organs or parts of the body of women which are attractive to men. This we call satr. Satr means to cover. For men, the satr which has been prescribed is from above the umbilicus to below the knees. If this much is covered, the purpose of the sharia is fulfilled. You may have additional dress, you may have pants and coat and shirts, oh, okay. But that part of body cannot be exposed except for the, the wives or the surgeon or doctor when there is need. These parts have to be covered. And for women, whole of the body is to be covered except the face only and the hands only and the feet only. It must be covered. That in addition to that, the body will be uncovered only for the husband or for the physician or surgeon. It has to be covered. Additionally, especially their bosoms and their chests, they should have an additional covering. And then there is the instruction that a woman's dress should not be very transparent type of dress, should not be very tight so that the body curves become apparent. The Prophet said, La Allahu kasiyatin ariyatin. Allah has cursed those women who, although they are dressed, they are naked. The dress is so fine that it is revealing the body or it is so tight that it is making prominent the curves of the body. But for this bosom or the chest additional cover, the head scarf has to be worn in this way that this is an additional covering for the chest. These are the commandments of the Sharia. Now comes the wheel. This is necessary when a woman has to meet or see someone who is non-mahram. Now, who is mahram? Please note. The relations 
with which a woman can never be married in any case they are mahrams father brother nephew her own nephew they are mahram not her husband's nephew her own brother not her husband's brother if the husband dies she can marry the brother of the husband mahram are only those with whom a woman can never be married and there's a list full list given in quran in surah an-nur all the other males are na mahram they are not mahrams non mahrams and before them in front of them a muslim woman will come covering their faces also this is my opinion but there is a difference of opinion on this subject among the legal experts in islam but i am giving you my opinion why if we think about the reason why these restrictions just contrary to what is happening in west men fully dressed and women half naked they just the reverse of what islam says and what is the reason i told you to put obstructions in the way of zina illegitimate sexual relationship obstruction don't have those conditions where you find chances for this so these obstructions have to be far and wide that these are the obstructions then i told you what is the aim strengthening the family if a male has seen some female some woman very pretty very attractive and now he is thinking about her what's the result the bond of love between him and his wife is weakened family becomes loose islam wants a strong family the attraction the both sexes have for each other should be focused on the spouses only that's all the stronger this bond of love the stronger is the family and healthier are the environment for the upbringing of the children the children being brought up in a environment where father and mother are in deep love they have deep regard for each other they have mutual confidence for each other these are the positive environments for the upbringing of the children and where there is distrust and they don't love each other but note islam allows a divorce if you are not compatible with each other somehow you can't go together don't keep on quarreling and fighting and fighting and quarreling you can separate but man husband has the authority to divorce wife does not have the authority to divorce she can get divorce through the agency of a court or the elders of the family not direct as i told you in this institution of family men and women are not equal not equal i admit it plainly so now there can be an objection to it regarding the economic conditions of the society do you want that their your women folk shouldn't work shouldn't help in the economy of the country no they can work number 1 they can teach in the hospital in the schools colleges universities but female schools girls colleges a separate university for women as today we have in tehran 
انڈر دی نیم آف فاطمہ زہرا یونیورسٹی ایکسکلوسولی ویمن دین دے کین بی ڈاکٹرس دے کین بی نرسز بٹ ان دی ویمنس ہاسپٹلس دین دیر وی کین ڈیولپ کاٹیج انڈسٹری وی ول ورکنگ ایٹ دیئر ہومس دے ہیو ڈونٹ ناٹ ٹو گو آؤٹ نو اسپینڈنگ آف دیئر ٹائم نو نیڈ آف اینی میک اپ ٹو گو آؤٹ دے کین ورک ایٹ دیئر ہومس کاٹیج انڈسٹریز دین وی کین ہیو اسپیشل انڈسٹریل یونٹس وی آر اونلی ویمن شوڈ ورک and only women should supervise then the whole primary education can be given to women children below the age of 10 okay there can be coeducation and give it to the women don't hire any man as teacher at that level you can use your women workforce but only if you have the real intention to obey allah and his messenger and abide by the sharia what has happened in west is the destruction of family clinton said in his new year's message i think two years before very soon the majority of our nation would be bastards he didn't use this word he said born without any wedlock this is the society and this is the testimony of the president of america and this family life it has deteriorated and been destroyed to an extent now bush says marriage 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 the males are not ready to marry why the family laws they are very unnatural as soon as you divorce your wife half of your property everything goes to her why should i marry we are living together we are not married living together children are being born without any wedlock the biggest problem is incest among the medicine which are mostly used are for the mental illnesses and i was told by psychiatrists that the biggest cause of these mental illnesses is incest it gives you a guilty conscience and that guilty conscience develops abortion now bush is saying no no there should be some restriction to abortion because the, the society is going but when the pope visited there was a demonstration by women against him because he is in favor of ban on abortion you know the beijing plus 5 conference held under the united nations organization general assembly social engineering but that social engineering is in the direction to destroy this family structure at all a prostitute has to be respected she is a sex worker why do you say something wrong about her someone is using his muscles to earn money someone is using and selling his faculties brain she is using a part of her body why do you object homosexuality just going against nature against nature destroying nature and now homosexual marriage is recognized a man is the husband a man is a wife a woman is the husband and a woman is a wife this is the depth to which 
the social structure and the social system of the West has gone down. It has to be restructured. It has to be re-engineered. But on the lines that I have put before you, and this is the Islamic social system and the status of women in Islam. Thank you very much for the attention that you have paid. Thank you. Dr. Srar's presentation or discourse has a positive side. On the positive side, he has presented his understanding of Quran and Hadith. And on the negative side, there is a critique of the Western a religious materialistic society and social setup. Now the floor is open for discussion. Yes, please. I read in the book that um, middle-aged women are allowed more freedom to go out to society. At what age does middle age start? It's not middle age. It's old age. But Allow then only there is a relaxation in the dress code. That's all. Not in she doesn't need mobility. to be to cover her hair, etc. But that is the only thing. So that doesn't not mean, that she should go out she and go to the know. mosque to pray. Yeah. No, it's not forbidden. It is not forbidden. Not forbidden, but you know we have to have separate lines in the mosque okay. for the women. Okay. Not intermixing. And the lines of the women have to be behind. So there are restrictions about that. First of all, I, I want to thank you for your, your clear uh, lectures. Uh, and they, I think it's very important for us in the West to understand Islam. And uh, your presentation of it was very helpful to me. So I really want to thank you. I'm grateful for being here. And it's an important event in my life. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I, I'm interested in is to know whether in the Muslim world uh, have there been any empirical studies about the happiness of families? Do you know that Muslim families are so much happier than families in the West, empirically? Because I, I, I cite this because of, of the experience we had when we went to Afghanistan, where women have been you know, pretty much subjected to some pretty terrible treatment in terms of not allowed, being allowed any educational opportunities and being treated pretty much like chattel. I mean, at least that's the experience I've been getting, I've been reading. And even in today's uh, newspaper that came through, my, through the auspices of the hotel, there was an article that talked about the, the sadness that families felt when daughters were born into their home. And the idea of having daughters rather than sons uh, seemed to be a, a very uh, negative kind of uh, experience for uh, Islamic families. And I, I just wondered what your reaction to that, those kind of ideas might be. Actually, we Muslims are not practicing Islam fully. And we are under the influence of our Hindu background on one side and the Western civilization on the other side. We are between the two and not practicing Islam. Now, according to Islam, a widow must be married if she is not very old, must be married. Islam doesn't like that you should remain bachelor. Marry. This is nature's demand. If you don't marry, you will go astray, this way or that way. So actually, now the happiness of the family, I have discussed, I think, the respect for the elders and the parents, and then the parents investing whole and soul into their offsprings. They don't keep anything, saving anything for their old age, no. So everything has a result. The psychology is different. About Afghanistan, you are misinformed. During the Taliban period, Actually, the co-education was finished and stopped. And they had not till the time to establish girls' schools and girls' colleges. They were not against the education of girls and women. Actually, they didn't have the time. 
so they didn't stop the education and then they don't prevent women from uh, education they had the plan to start girls colleges girls schools etc etc i might have missed some of your point well i just wondered if there were empirical studies I mean, you you sort of announced to us that uh, muslim families are happy but is there any documentation scientifically or empirically that that is the case any more so than in the west no no documentation but i think this is the general feeling of all people in the west and east yeah the family structure in islam in among the muslims are still to this date although there are influences from the east and from the west my point is that in the west we know that families aren't happy that marriage is in trouble because we've studied we've studied families you know so we it's been a kind of empirical study we know this i don't know that it's true in the in, in the muslim world but here you know the percentage of divorce is very little very small once married you are married forever the whole life that doesn't necessarily make for happiness yes why not you will remain together if you are both happy uh, can i say one thing uh, it, come on now it, if people stay married together that means they may be happy yes it also means uh, it also could mean that they may not be happy i mean if divorce in a society is frowned upon which it is and or even not allowed unless the man says it is all right then is it not possible that in some families or many families we could have a very unhappy situation we could have an unhappy situation perhaps most especially with the woman is that not possible what the teaching of islam is that you get separated if you are not happy among yourself and you the woman can get the divorce without the consent of the husband through court court will give the verdict you are separate now but still you know the this percentage of divorce here is very low very low Yeah, yeah. Can I ask one thing? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yes. Just because it is related to the subject. Oh, yes. Now, in in Muslim countries, mostly men has the right of divorce. If he says you are divorced, finished. But still, the rate of divorce is very low. This is a sign. Okay. Now, in West, we have to go to court, etc., etc. But here is not so. If man says to his wife, "You are divorced, finished." but still the rate of divorce like turkey is very low and although we have a lot of economic a very severe economic conditions etc but still rate of divorce is almost zero i mean this is a sign uh, i think it is an answer to a very per- pertinent do- point dr ralph's uh, question yeah. i mean this is a sign it is an empirical study <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, just a comment from my family background. My grandfather divorced <coughs> my grandmother at least one million times, and she never left him. <laughs> That's true, and he was in a state of anger most of the time. You are exaggerating. There might not be there might not be million days in their lives. <laughs> I mean, you know, lots of times she times. never left him. Okay. Well, first of all again it's a privilege for me to be here to be at this table thank you uh my question uh is about polygamy polygamy yes it is allowed but it is not imperative that you must marry more than one or two or three it is allowed and the grounds are number one there are certain occasions for example this war in the first world war second world war how many men perished now women they were without husbands if there is polygamy they will also be living normal human life secondly the sexual urge in males is not equal in all of them the lust for wealth is not equal among all the humans 
in the same way, the sexual urge. There might be certain males who are so much stronger in their sexual urge that one wife can't do it. Because the sexual process in women is restricted, interrupted by the periods, by pregnancy, and so on and so forth. So polygamy is natural, but it is not essential. So this could be one of the reasons for the lower rate of divorce then? That? Lower rate of divorce. Divorce could be, this could be one of the reasons. No. Because in, in the States, uh, this would be considered, I mean in the States, what I mean is in Christian marriage, this is considered adultery. To have second wife is adultery. Yes, yes. no, not in Islam. There you have to divorce one wife to have another one. Yeah. Yes, that is, why, that is one factor for the uh, greater number of divorces. Or you have to accuse her of some adultery and some, you know, something, and then only can the, you know, Christian marriage can be finished. Can so that? these are things, you know. Can I have that you again? Sorry. Now, now that I've started, I'm... you said earlier in your lecture that uh, that uh, the Quran speaks to human equality. Human equality. There's no one higher nor lower, and so forth. Um, and then you said. It's whatever you have in your heart that counts. And I wonder if it's more than that. It's not only what it's in your heart, it's what you do. You know, it's what you do, it's, it's your actions. We talk about orthodoxy, right thinking, but we also talk about orthopraxy, right doing. Right doing. Both are very, very important. Yes. I, admit. I guess you recognize it. I accept. But, but uh, you know, in terms of equality in, in marriage, uh, I, I, you say there is no equality. There is no? No equality. No equality in marriage? That the man is head of the, the, man is head of the woman? Yes. yes. But, but in, in, our, in our conception of marriage, uh, it's a partnership. The man and the woman engage in a partnership. Some have more skills perhaps in business or in some other respect than the other. And so they contribute to the good of the whole rather than a kind of strict division of labor. So there is there's this kind of sharing that in good marriage takes place. At least that's been my experience and, it, and the experience of people who have been involved in good marriages. It's not a superior, inferior kind of relationship. I didn't use these words for that no, relationship. but they sounded like it. Actually, marriage is a partnership. But even in partnership, if you have a common business with your friend, maybe you own two-thirds and the other one one-third. So equality in authority and in rights, in the administration of the family, that is not there. You have to have one on top, otherwise there will be chaos. No, I don't agree. At least that's not been my Yes, experience. you are free to disagree. It's not for me to say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Nirmal Singh, please. Well, firstly, I, I, something in, in a lighter vein. Uh, so I, I was thinking that there is a window of opportunity for me here in something that you said, that uh, if you bring up two daughters, educate them, and marry them, you have a place reserved for you in paradise. My wife and I, we have done it for three daughters. <laughs> So I but you have to be a Muslim to qualify for that. Well, so <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that with three, a second class citizen might make it. <laughs> you need to have another one because you are two. Dr. Ian Markham. Um, I want to just focus a little bit on your social segregation part of your talk, where you talked about the fact it's very important in the Islamic society, the sexes are kept separate. Uh, and that implies, includes education and hospitals and universities. All spheres of life. All spheres of life. Is there any theology in Islam which would stress the fact that 
when God created men and women, God created two genders that bring different insights, different perspectives, different ideas, which can complement and enhance the other. And that therefore, in social relations between the sexes, it's good that they're often together, because it means that the ideas that shape an institution or an organisation have the different perspectives of the two genders, which enhances life generally. And isn't there any sort of idea that there's something rich and captivating about the diversity of God's creation and the fact that we ought to enjoy that sexual gender difference as part of that diversity? Enjoy your wives, not others. Well, well I, actually God has created and God has given us, us the law, the straight path. And he ordained in the very beginning, whatever guidance comes to you from me, you have to accept it and obey it. So that is the law. You have to obey it. And he only knows what you are speculating. Allah knows all these things. But if there is intermixing, is there not the danger that you fall in love? Well, if I may have a quick supplementary. You, you, uh, many religious traditions are committed to the idea that the best way to avoid sin is to avoid temptation. Right? Yes. And that, that's the assumption you make. Yes, yes. And that's true. You know, if, if um, it's very unwise for me to go to a brothel if I want to remain faithful to my wife, and therefore I should avoid brothels. And that's a good ethical principle. But it's how far you take that. And to insist on total separateness seems to be very, very extreme. Surely... At home, the brothers and sisters are not separate. They are living with each other. The father and mother are there. They are not separated. You know, this concept of Maron, you know, no man can ever imagine that he can marry his sister. So all those, you know, sexual thinking and imagination won't come at all. But where there is a chance for marriage, then, you know, your sexual urge and your desires, they come into play. So this is it about Islam and our, you know, teachings. Would you, would you say that uh, Islam and its social system, as you describe it, is almost identical with the Jewish social system? We know that the law of Moses was Islamic. And there are few changes only in the law of Muhammad And you know, they don't take pork. We don't take pork. It's forbidden. It's forbidden. In the same way, you know, many things are common. Regarding law and Sharia, the Muslims and Jews are nearest to each other. Regarding the person of Jesus, the Muslims and Christians are very close to each other. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. We believe in his miracles. We believe he was taken to heaven alive. Only difference is that we don't believe that he was crucified. Someone else was crucified. And that clue I got from the gospel according to Barnabas that it was Judas Iscariot whose features were changed to those of Jesus. And he was crucified, and rightly, because he betrayed Jesus. So we think that he was taken to the heavens before he was arrested. And the features of Judas Iscariot were changed to the features of Jesus. He was crucified, and Allah has taken Jesus, and he will come. The second coming of Jesus is absolutely common between uh, Muslims and uh, Christians. May I follow Roger since he... Um, uh, I had a question which I'll ask, but briefly, uh, I suppose the answer to you, Roger, is that there is no one social system uh, 
uh, within Judaism. And if I take um, uh, traditional Judaism uh, as defined in the Talmud, which is authoritative, then the position of women in that traditional Judaism is far inferior to the position of women in Islam. And uh, in regard to uh, marriage and in regard to sex, uh, there are many similarities. But in other ways, in terms of uh, equality uh, that uh, I understand that women have in Islam, uh, there is, in the most traditional part of Judaism, no such equality whatsoever. And if I had time, which would be uh, more than uh, five or six days fully, uh, I suppose that I could uh, uh, specify this, and uh, I think everyone here would be terribly shocked at how bad the situation is. But I want to emphasize uh, finally here in this comment that that is only true in one part of Judaism. So there's no one social system. But now having said that, I have one brief question for you that goes right to the beginning. It, and it's a question uh, that comes from the very beginning of your talk this afternoon. When you said um, uh, individuals, male and female, are born equal, totally equal. And then, of course, uh, what they do in their lives, uh, you mentioned one thing they do, if some acquire far more knowledge than others, then that puts them at a higher status. But my question is this, would you not agree that everyone is not born totally equal? Some people, some men and, and some women, are born with far more intellectual qualities than others. Uh, that is verifiable. If that is the case, then we would expect what has undoubtedly been the case, that those who are born with far more intellectual abilities are able in their lifetime to acquire far more knowledge, and if indeed that puts them at a higher status, then my question is, uh, is it not the case that perhaps then everyone is not born equally? I again say and stress that by birth they are equal absolutely. When, due to their higher intelligence, they acquire more knowledge, more wisdom, then they become superior. But the status as humans is absolutely equal. As moral agents, <coughs> as persons. Yes, uh, sister. I, I have been. If adultery is committed, uh, what are the consequences? If some unmarried person, male or female, commits, then there are stripes, hundred stripes. If a married man or woman commits it, then he or she is to be stoned to death. And this is also, is this the case in Judaism also? Stoned to death? Is um, it there? It, 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 it was. It was. No, 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 that's not why I'm hesitating. I'm hesitating because it has happened. Um, uh, there are, as I'm sure there are in Islam, some Judaic theologians who say it has happened because uh, that uh, is what is ordained from God, but there are many other very traditional Orthodox theologians who would disagree with that. So um, uh, you are not incorrect uh, that um, there, there has been that belief uh, that has happened. Um, uh, but uh, that, again, is only a one aspect of Judaism. And since I myself do not claim to have the true, total, correct word of God as to which is the most correct interpretation in Judaism, I won't go any further than that, although it's fairly obvious that I would certainly not agree with the stoning to death. Please. Yes, Dr. Israr, thank you very much for your lecture tonight and all these days that we've been with you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask a couple of questions and also make a statement, but I'll leave the statement until after you've had a chance to answer the questions. 
Uh, my question has to do with um, the issue of divorce. And, um, and the other, that's one question. Uh, can you delineate some of the consequences of divorce if a man seeks divorce versus if a woman seeks divorce? Maybe that would be instructive for, for everyone because there are differences. And could you also um, talk about, um, it just flew out of my head. Um, consequences of a man seeking divorce versus a woman seeking divorce from her husband. Man doesn't seek divorce, he divorces. Right. He has the authority to divorce straight off. So the consequences But a woman perhaps. has to seek divorce, and we call it khola, and she has to surrender total or a part of the door money that was paid to her at the time of marriage. So that is the law in Islam. Can I ask, does that include cases where the woman seeks divorce for cause? In other words, the husband has failed in his Islamic duties to her. For example, he's failed to support her or whatever yes, other yes. duties. Yes, yes. On this ground, so she can she, seek divorce. And does she still have to seek divorce? Even the on dower? the ground that the wife doesn't like the husband, she can seek divorce. And the Prophet decided such. A woman came and said, I don't like him. Then he got her confined to a room which had all, you know, bad things in it. And she remained there for the night. In the morning, the Prophet asked, how you pass your night? This was the best night that I have passed when my husband was away. So the Prophet decided, okay, you are separated. This is the right of woman. And if a man divorces his wife, what, does, what are his obligations to her? Are there any? Only for a certain time he has to support her. Three months, four months, different, you know, financially. And he has to pay, if he has not yet paid the door money, now he has to pay. That's all. Nothing more. Thank you. I thought of my other question, and it has to do with, I was reading in your uh, monogram on women and the, the movement, the Tenzin movement, and the role of women in it, and you did speak in it about the role of women in the revolution, the Islamic revolution, and how their role is different. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, women have a role to play, definitely, alongside with the men, you know. Because the ayah that I quoted, that uh, refers particularly to the revolutionary movement. <coughs> In that revolutionary movement, women were with the men. Hijrah to Habsha. Men and women both. And one man, one woman, husband and wife, they were martyred by Abu Jahl. So they laid down their lives. But then later on, they prepared their sons to sacrifice their lives for the propagation of Islam. And during the movement, they can propagate Islam to women and to their own family. Men also who are mahram. To the brothers, sons, the uncles, etc., etc., et the nephews, you prepare them to propagate Islam. So this is the role of women. We have that section, women's section in Tanzim Islami. But there is segregation. <laughs> Can I revisit? She has a comment. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, and my comment actually. I, I don't think that you'll accept this, but I'll go ahead and, and try. Um, my comment comes out of my background in psychology. My bachelor's degree was in psychology, and um, I've had an abiding interest in it. And my studies have led me to the conclusion that it's a sort of a cliche. I think uh, most people have heard it. Violence begets violence. and. The other part of that is that violence does damage, 
to the human soul, the, both to those who are the recipients of the violence and those who do violence to others, are damaged. Um, and there are tons of studies, all kinds of studies um, in so sociology, psychology, that bear this out. Um, when we think about revolution and we think about the, the suffering, the inevitable suffering on all sides that occurs um, in revolution, the, the revolution you talk about, I worry um, that there would be irreparable damage to human beings, to children, to the psyches of men, women, and children. And I wonder how a good society can come out of um, beings that are so severely damaged. We know that even in a family, when children are the recipients of violence or women are the recipients of violence in a home, um, there's damage that never goes away. And that is just, you know, could be beatings, could be abuse of various sorts. Imagine the killing, um, this kind of violence that revolution inevitably brings. So I worry about this, and I worry about this third stage of your program. And um, I'd like you to comment on that. Well, actually, that will be discussed tomorrow, but right now. Then we shouldn't punish any criminal. Why to send them to jails? They are damaged psychologically. But for the good of the society, you have to do it. In the same way, to overthrow an oppressive regime, a discriminating regime, an exploitative regime, which is hurting the whole humanity, hurting all men and women, then you have to use some violence. And operating, you know, there's gangrene in the other, you cut it off. For the benefit of the total body, you have chopped off the arm of the person. So this is a normal procedure. Yes. Yeah, welcome, please. Um, <clears throat> we haven't used the word feminist yet, uh, feminism or feminist. And um, I'm very sympathetic to feminism. And I, I think I'm sympathetic to it for two reasons. Uh, the first is that It's clear that in a society where men have had a lot of power, the treatment of women has, has not been good. And I worry that one outcome of the theology that you've expounded is that women will end up being servants or slaves of the man at home, serving them in whatever way often using, perhaps using force to get what they want. And I think that that is obviously wrong uh, for all sorts of religious reasons. I think that's obviously wrong. The second reason I worry, uh, the second reason I'm sympathetic to feminism is because it, it, in a society where we share the power with women, then the option of both having a family and having a career are also shared. And I think that's good because it means you get better fathers who take more interest in their children. And you also get a better society because the resources of intellect and ability serve society more effectively. And therefore, a society where feminism is taken so seriously is a society where both men and women contribute effectively at home, but also contribute more effectively at work. Can you tell me what you will definitely mean by feminism? Feminism is the equality of men and women. Equality. Equality. So part of the equality we admit, but as husband and wife they are not equal. And if the wife is not ready, she can get divorced. But the discipline of the family is more important. And you know, there are two sides. One is legal, the other is moral. Morally, 
Quran and Hadith, the Prophet say, be kind to the women, be lenient to them. The best among you are those who treat their women folk in the best way. This is the moral education. And those, both things go by side by side. As I told you, you know, if there is separation, the children belong to father, legally, not mother. But, as I told you, regarding respect and service and going, doing good, the mother is three times more than the father. So you have to balance. The law is there and then the moral teachings are there. Roger. Let me try and be a little bit more critical than what we've been so far. You start off by saying at the very early part, this will not be easily palatable to the Western mind. And I think you're right. <coughs> and you're right because your social system exists in a vacuum. And you're critical of the Western family because you don't look at the social system in the context in which it exists. Very briefly, I'm going to outline just a little bit of that context. Before 1960s, the divorce rate in Western societies was very low. After 1960, it rose inexorably. And I would be the first to be anxious and worry about what is happening. But it is, by comparison to what you have outlined, a revolutionary social system in the West. And we are learning every generation. And I suspect every generation we produce is better adapted to the world whereby families are controlled by contraception, which is a technical revolution for, so, for any social system. And because your social system exists in a vacuum, it seems to us deeply oppressive. And of the one thing that I've heard so far since I've been here, it is that oppression that we find so difficult to accept. Now, of course, it's ideal that old people should be looked after by their families. But you have to look at the context in which the breakdown of families happen, the growth of a capitalist society which you wish to have in your new revolutionized society. And if you have capitalism as you wish to have it, then you will have the same breakdown as we have to the present time. I said we have a limited capitalism. <coughs> we have to change the capital. And there are steps. Interest, bad. Speculation, bad. Trading only cash. Or if it is for future, total prices to be paid in the beginning. So the capitalism of West, modern capitalism, and the capitalism of Islam, and they are very far apart. And I couldn't understand what you mean by a vacuum. You can say that we are existing in vacuum, but only from one point of view. That a civilization has dominated the whole of the globe. And we are against that civilization. But we are powerless up till now. We dislike it. But we are very much in it. Only we need some Lenin, according to you. <laughs> Roger, he gave it back to you. That's very good. Can I revisit the issue of uh, segregation from the standpoint of political and social economy? If one looks at uh, contemporary Muslim societies, <coughs> empirical Muslim societies, from Indonesia to Morocco, 
most Muslim societies have not been urbanized yet. This is very clear in the largest Muslim country, Indonesia. It's very clear in Bangladesh. It's very clear in Pakistan. And in the countryside, in peasant economies, women are extremely active in the labor force. And this is very true in tribal societies, in the desert, in the Sahara, in West Africa, in the desert in Arabia. <coughs> women are extremely active in the labor force of the desert. Which means that throughout human history, women have never been absent and there has never been segregation because of the economic necessities of life. Now, and this is also true in urban societies. Now, modern contemporary urban societies, there, there is no segregation between men and women in these societies. Uh, and I do understand, that's why I go back to Roger's point about the vacuum that we're talking about that uh, the kind of revolution that you are calling for seems to be a comprehensive total revolution. It is not just ideological, but economic, political, yes, social, ide ideology covers uh, all the civilizational, yes. and so on and so forth. Yes. And it seems that this is going to be a major task. It is a major task. It to is solve. definitely a major task, not an easy task. But to... You know, I have seen in the Arabian desert women taking a row of camels, but fully clad, their faces hidden, their hands in gloves, their feet in socks. They were working. In our countryside also, the women, they are not doing any makeup. They have all their body covered up. The satr is there, and you know they have to work with their men. Where their men are there, yes. in the field, their mahrams are there. So actually, if we take the whole situation as a whole, it's not very far off. I, I, I do want to revisit this, uh, the power relationship within the family structure, because I, 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 I find that the key words are obey and obedience. The key word is that the man will be provider. The key word is that the woman will obey and be obedient. Now, and I, I, I'm so glad that uh, Ibrahim brought out uh, this fact that women have been and continue to be major economic contributors to family income in all segments of society, irrespective of whatever their faith persuasion may be. And there are numerous studies, uh, uh, you know, I myself have carried out in Indian context and, and, and we, we have found them. So what I therefore uh, conclude from that position is this, that the man really has not been a provider the way it was expected the man should have been. The women have had to go out and work, and at the same time we place upon them the burden of rearing the family to bring up the children. And if I know the Indo-Pak men, which I think I should know, then we think my mother thought that sons were God's special gift. And that there is so much of evidence about uh, the infanticide of uh, females uh, in, in, in this subcontinent. So men don't want to do much more than what they are doing. The burden is continuously transferring on to women, and they have carried it ever so long. I really don't know why they want to go out and work. I really don't know why they want to go out. I think they should possibly agree with you and say, hey, tell these men to be good providers before they ask me to obey them. I agree with you, brother. The burden has to be borne by the males. And let me state here. This is the worst exploitation of women. They bear children, they suckle them, 
they rear them and they have to go out also to work a stay at home mom is the biggest blessing for the children we are actually so we need we are exploiting revolution here so i am always I speaking of so. a revolution we need a different kind of revolution here altogether <laughs> different kind where we bring one aspect of that revolution you dislike <laughs> but the other you like it <laughs> we should continue our dialogue Uh, in an ideal Islamic society, uh, perhaps you touched upon that, and I may have missed it. But would women be allowed to vote for a president or someone? Let's say. I said in the morning, yes, yeah. they will vote. And women who are beyond that age can also be elected yeah. for the parliament. Yes. Uh, the age which sister referred, you know. Okay, I, I just another quick question uh, regarding women and uh, if they were permitted by the husbands, by the husband to work, uh, would she would she uh, be expected to share part of her wealth or earnings, I should say, with the husband? There is nothing haram about it. But she cannot go and work in an environment where there is mixing of men and women. I told, she can be a teacher, she can be a lady doctor, but she earnings. can be a nurse. But you know, the working hours of women's duty should be less, so that they can look after their. So he's asking about the earnings. The earnings well, well, a teacher, if she is working, she is earning. Yeah, is, is he going to share it with her husband or not? Is she expected to share the er earnings no. with the husband? No, it will be her. But if she does it voluntarily, it's good. Well, that's a different story. Thank you. Dr. Markham, last question. Maybe. It's, it's, been, um, yes. it's been generally accepted um, that between 5 and 10% of the human population, in whatever country they live, are homosexual. About 5 to 10 percent of the population is homosexual. How would Islam uh, regard these people? How would they... Would they what, it's a what, very big sin to be punished. How would they be punished? That can be a tazir, you know. A punishment can be fixed by the state. It has not been mentioned in Quran. We have two types of punishments, one which have been mentioned specifically in Quran and the Hadith, and the others which a state, Islamic state, can determine itself. But I missed your point. What percentage of people are homosexual according to your between idea? Five to ten, hmm? Between 5 to 10 percent. 5 to 10 percent. Actually, if I may make... A comment on this, I have just read a hadith which is authentic in which the Prophet said in this instance when two of same sex commit, you know, homosexuality or, you know, this sexual relations, then the doer as well as the one who is being, they should be killed. Actually, But, I'm not an expert in Islamic law. That's not my subject. And why? This is because unless there is the will at the national level to establish and enforce Islamic law, there is no use in going into these discussions. So first of all, a revolution has to be brought about. And after that, there will be a decision that now Islamic law is to be enforced. Then we shall have dialogue among ourselves. What is really Islamic and what is something which has come from outside. Uh, regarding the statement that 5 to 10 percent people are homosexual, there is a very strong uh, scientific study that regarding animals in their natural habitat, they don't exhibit homosexuality. In a zoo, they do. In a zoo, they do? In a zoo, they do. There are seven or eight things 
which include, for instance, obesity is also something that animals you know, get into in a, in a zoo, but not in the natural habitat. Somewhere, the current day modern day civilization is producing pressures and stresses which are causing this thing. I don't disagree with the figures, but the cause is something that we need to look at. Maybe the kind of solution that Dr. Israr is yeah. presenting will take care of this side. So, do, uh, so I'm somewhere sort of contesting that this is a national thing. I think the national thing is, of course, uh, I have to... Introspection. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I thank you all. Allahu Akbar, 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 Allahu Akbar,